Hi, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, Mila, can you let me know if you can hear me? Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. I think uh, we should be fine now, but I'm just checking with Mila to see if everything's okay and everybody has a link. So I'm just gonna wait for her for a sec. Perfect, okay. Thanks, Mila. Okay, so hi, uh, my name is Dee Courtney. Um, this is really weird uh, not having anyone on the other end. So sorry if I like laugh at myself um, while I'm doing this. Uh, and sorry about the technical difficulties. I think it should be fine now. Yep, and everybody's on, great. So, okay, um, I'm gonna talk to you guys about extensions. Um, and I know there's a link on the event page uh, to the stream uh, where you can post questions as well. So if anybody has questions, uh, definitely post them on that because um, you don't necessarily know if I'm gonna be talking about the things that are most useful to you um, or that answer your questions. So do go ahead and do that um, if you do have questions. So with like the very basics of an extension of like what you need to do in extension um, and in back half in general to win a debate. So I think there are four key elements or five, depending on how you look at it, um, that make a good extension. Uh, first, obviously it needs to be new. Um, but I think the thing that people forget sometimes about extensions is that they don't just need to be new. They need to be more important than what happened in top half. So there's no point having an extension that is new but less relevant to the debate or new but less persuasive than what happened in top half um, that's a situation where you'll find uh that you have succeeded in like you've technically succeeded in having an extension um but it doesn't really serve you in the debate um so your extension needs to to be more important and the key here is that it needs to actually be more important so there's like i think that we under credit judges or, or or discredit judges and think that if we just call something an extension as many times as possible or call our extension really important as many times as possible the judges will just buy it and um, but like judges are smart people and if your extension is new but unpersuasive and um, that's unlikely to to serve your purpose uh, which I assume is winning the debate. <laughs> Otherwise, this workshop probably won't be super useful. Um, so those are the first kind of two elements uh, or one element uh, in the way that I look at it. The second, I think, uh, is is potentially more, I guess, disputed or like people wouldn't necessarily agree with me on this, which is that I think it needs to be interesting. Um, and there are several reasons for this. Uh, I think that one of the important reasons uh, is that even though judges are smart people and um, they're also human, they get bored and they get tired. And in their third or fourth round during a day, uh, or even in the first round during a day, it's kind of hard to stay focused for a whole hour on what you're hearing. Um, and I think that having an interesting extension advantages you hugely in the sense that if you're saying what sounds like rehashing stuff from top half judges tune out but also if you're saying stuff that's just boring and um, i think most good judges wouldn't tune out but having an interesting extension will make them uh, listen more and be more concerned about what you're saying and be more attentive to what you're saying which means they're more likely to get the sort of um I suppose the sort of niches of your case and the nuance of your case and uh, whereas if they're kind of only half listening or if they're only listening the bare minimum to take down what you're saying they might miss those important little nuances um, and I also think it prevents you from getting bored if you have a case that you really care about or have a case that you think is interesting and um, I think you're a lot more likely to um, stay focused on the debate and stay focused on winning whereas sometimes if you have an extension that you feel like you're just sort of aiming for the third or um, if you have an extension that you don't really care about it can be hard to stay focused throughout that. The third thing is that it needs to be clear and this is really really important. 
like I think every speech needs to be clear um, but I think like in an extension speech in top half right if you're the PM and your speech is a mess the DPM like it's not ideal it's not an ideal situation but the DPM does have seven minutes to give your case again in a much clearer way in a way that can be understood and that still counts and that's still credited in extension if, if your extension when you give it as the extension speaker is not clear and is not persuasive at all because it's not clear because the judges can't understand it and the some speaker gets up and then clarifies that like it's kind of shaky ground that you're on in terms of whether or not that's new material because if it's not proven at the point of that the extension speaker sits down or if it's not at least given in such a way that can be understood or given in such a way that it could be reasonably persuasive and um, it's kind of hard to credit both speakers uh, with giving that material but also even if that weren't the case um, the some speaker also has a huge amount of stuff to do in seven minutes like they have to respond to three different teams um, and explain why your material was the most important so they don't have time to clarify your mess if you are a mess in extension they don't have time to deal with um with basically rehashing your speech in a way that can be understood so it's really really important that your speech is clear um, and i find that clarity is helped by using as much paper as you need to i use loads i know that sounds um like the opposite of what you would think uh but i think that for example i always used lots of sheets of paper but wrote really big um, and only had one or two sentences on each sheet so that I could keep everything really separate. And um, different things work for different people, but I think whatever helps you be clearer is really, really important. And then finally, I think the fourth thing is that in back half, um, you need to be responsive. Um, and I am gonna move on to tactics and, uh, in a minute, and I don't want you to think that, that means having four minutes of rebuttal in your extension speech, which I definitely think you shouldn't have. Um, but, between the two speeches, you need to remember, like to, you need to basically not forget about top half um, and not forget to beat the team opposite you. Because uh, if you do that, even if your material is interesting, persuasive and clear, um, you'll lose the comparative, which is I know the word that we all love to talk about. Um, and that uh, the word that seems to be the reason that so many of us lose debates that we feel we shouldn't lose. Um, so your extension needs to be comparative um, and it needs, it needs to be responsive and it ideally should be responsive at every point rather than having, you know, four minutes of rebuttal at the start and then three minutes, which is your case. All of your case should be responding, I think, um, to the other speeches that have come in the debate. So in terms of, uh, in terms of how, I think the, the question that I get asked most often, um, not just in the context of workshops or coaching or when, when I'm chatting to people about extensions, actually a question that I get asked most often as a judge when I'm giving feedback is what could we have done in back half to come up with new material or what could we have done in back half to win that debate when the top half team was reasonably good and they took all of our material. So um, the first thing that I want to say about this is about prep and then I'm going to talk you through my extension checklist which is a list that I use to basically pull extensions out of, out of the air when I have nothing. Um, so if you really, really feel like you have nothing, that checklist is probably going to be, well, hopefully going to be useful. The first thing is in terms of prep. Way too often, I think, teams go into prep and, um, and they're in back half and they come up with maybe one or two points that they really like and that they think are really interesting and then run with them and prep them for 15 minutes walk into the room and then hear those points given nearly identically by the top half team and then they then repeat the top half's case with slightly different language and call it an extension because it's what they prepped and they don't have anything else you can't do that in an extension it's if if you find yourself doing that you you absolutely have to change your prep strategy there are different prep strategies for extension but the one that i think is the most effective um, and it's probably important to know that i think part of this is being able to communicate really well with your partner um, and being able to understand each other's ideas quickly um, is to sit down and prep everything literally any idea that you can think of that might be relevant or might be good in the debate anything that is convincing 
like I don't obviously don't prep stuff that's useless because that's you might you might as well not give a speech if you're prepping stuff that you know isn't going to be convincing but prep every single idea that you can think of that uh, makes sense to you or that you think could be useful in the debate and um, only spend one or two minutes on each thing and hopefully walk into the debate with with like eight or ten ideas have them written down on a sheet and then cross them off as the top half team deals with them and whatever you're left with on your page uh, the most convincing parts of that are your extension now obviously if you're left with everything don't run 10 ideas that would be a terrible idea but um pick the most important stuff maybe rank it all and then pick the highest ranking ideas that you have or obviously if you think of something else in the debate and um, that can be helpful as well and you can just run with that um but i find that a lot of the time teams lose in back half because they prepped in such a way that they didn't have ideas left over and it didn't mean that they couldn't have thought of those ideas it's that they didn't try to think of more ideas so i think it's important to um to prep uh like as many ideas as possible um basically while you're while you're in prep time so that you then because that, because and one of the main reasons for that is so that when the debate happens, you and your partner don't have to uh, be whispering your entire case to each other. And that will still happen sometimes, but it's ideal if you kind of can just point to the page and go, this is what I'm running with. This is the best thing that they haven't stolen. And then your sum speaker understands what they're going to be summing when they get up. And um, so... I'm going to talk you through my extension checklist now and this is really for times when the um when you really kind of don't have an idea uh or when you don't when you're it's normally when you're in the debate or when you're kind of in prep and you feel like the motion is shallow and you need to be prepared for the idea that you won't have anything that the top half team haven't dealt with um, and I'm going to talk through some motions that this could kind of apply to as well. Um, I'll use world's motions because I think most people would have, I would be familiar with them. So, um, point one is really simple. Is there any actor or group uh, that have, any actor that has a stake in the motion or any group that is, that has been affected by the motion um, that has, that have not been discussed in the top half? So, a motion might specifically might ask you to talk about a specific actor but even in the most specific and narrow debates a lot of the time there is an actor or a group that you can bring into the debate um, and then make them sound important because the best thing about speaking in extension is that the top half teams are done each of them will probably get one POI in the back half if they're lucky well, and each of them probably will get one POI in the back half and two if they're lucky. Um, and so even if you bring in a group that doesn't seem intuitively more relevant or more important, um, you can frame it in such a way that they are. So bringing in a new group can be really helpful. So like an example of that would be, um, let's say... This, one of the motions from Worlds was, uh, this house believes that the world would be a better place if women from privileged backgrounds turned down any benefits arising from affirmative action programs. So let's say, for example, um, in the top half, you know, um, the, the discussion mostly centered around the effect on feminism as a whole um, and how, where sort of privileged women uh, from middle class backgrounds sit in feminism as a whole. So the top half talked about how we get more people involved in feminism um, and how feminism can be most successful and how feminism can reach more women. Um, and then it, it might have talked a little bit about, I guess, uh, minority groups and how they can benefit from this. So like women of color uh, or queer women. Um, and in that situation, uh, you could bring in another group of women who have been affected by this. So like you could talk more uh, about trans women and you could talk specifically, um, or you could talk about uh, women with disabilities and you could talk specifically about 
uh, the kinds of women that would benefit most from the policy. And um, that's just an example. And that it won't always happen that way. A lot of the time, top half teams will think of everything obvious. Um, but, um, and then for example, like round seven is a good example of this, where there are lots of different actors that you can talk about. This house believes that South Korea should produce nuclear weapons. So if the top half, for example, focuses, as you would imagine they might, on like South Korea, uh, probably the US and probably China and how they all react to this. And um, there's really important stuff in that debate about the reaction of other actors in the region. So ASEAN states and um, states like Japan um, and obviously I like is in North Korea would be discussed in the top half, but specifically the, the sort of regional internal reaction. Um, and you can make that seem more important because you can talk about how uh, how you know even if we forget that the US like isn't the center of everything um, and when we think that it, a lot of the time it is you can talk about how it's a lot more important how a country like Japan will react to something um, or like a whole region will react to something how, how that's more important than than sort of than what was discussed in top half. So those are just a couple of examples of where you can do that. Um, and that's applicable to a lot of different motions. So um, I think that can be really, really useful in terms of thinking of um, thinking of a new, I guess, thing to talk about. Um, and you should always explain why they're more important, not why they're important, why they're more important than what happened in top half. It's really, really important to always be comparative across the table, um, but in back half especially, it's really, really important to be comparative up the table as well and constantly say like, oh yeah, like first prop are very good. We think they should probably come second. But like realistically our stuff was the most important in the debate. And you should be doing that in extension as well, not just in some. Uh, so the second part of the checklist is, is there anything that was discussed in top half, but sort of, I guess, um, only in one specific time frame. So what I mean by that is, um, was there anything that was discussed in top half where top half discussed the short-term effects of the policy on a certain thing, but failed to deal with the long-term effects? Or where they discussed you know, medium and long-term effects, but actually lost out on, on a short-term thing that might be more important? Um, so going back to the South Korea debate, um, for example, let's say um top half talk about talk a lot about north korea's reaction to south korea producing nuclear weapons which is obviously going to be bad and there may be a war and it, the reactions may be poisonous and um, or for example on you know on prop and um, you might be saying no like it'll actually be quite positive in the sense that north korea um, will be scared off and, and there will be a much more present uh, deterrent to the nuclear tests and stuff like that. Um, I think in back half, something that you can make sound more important um, is the idea of discussing the long-term goals of North and South Korea's relationship. Like, do we want reunification or do we want those countries to actually get back to having proper diplomatic relations and how do we actually make that happen in the long term and this is a really really handy way to make an extension because when people say long term for some reason or other they just kind of feel like it's more important which is weird um but it's as if because long term means more time any harm that you're giving is like seems more harmful or any benefit that you're giving seems more beneficial a lot of the time debaters make arguments that end with things like and since that is a long-term effect it is more important and that doesn't really get challenged very often so if you can take a short-term benefit or harm and make it long term and um, that can be really really handy but you can also take something long term uh, and make it short term but make it bigger so for example like in in like this house would temporarily and significantly relax minimum labor standards in times of unusually high unemployment including workplace health and safety standards minimum wage working hours restrictions etc and that was around nine at Dutch worlds and um, a lot of top half teams in that debate i imagine talked about like on prop for example talked about economic recovery and how we best deal with the reality of 
uh, economic failure um, and how we best get people back to work um, and how we stop businesses from failing, which is totally reasonable. Um, now those impacts are quite broad um, and, they're, and they could be seen to be quite medium and long term. So how do we generally speaking um, in the long term deal with economic shocks? But in back half, you could change that and make it short term, but make it sound more important by saying, uh, if you were on op, there is nothing that justifies short term ripping away of like a family's income that, that could cause um, severe mental health issues that could, that's been known, uh, like economic shocks have been known to lead to suicide, which is unacceptable. Um, that kind of policy could lead immediately to people becoming severely ill um, and without being able to consent into that, this completely unjustified policy. So the long-term effects don't matter. The short-term effects are too poisonous. Or on prop, uh, you could argue that in the short term, people don't lose their jobs, uh, which is the most important thing in the debate. Um, and that uh, is so crucial that uh, you know, even though maybe the economy as a whole, blah, 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 and top half, yes, very good and all that. But um, it is the state's responsibility to make people, um, need to save people's jobs, uh, even if that's just in the short term, uh, because that can be such a benefit to people um, psychologically and economically and all that stuff. So, so the, the key here, and I think that this is something to keep in mind throughout this entire workshop and any time you're in extension, is that any time I'm giving you an argument or any time I'm saying anything, I'm sure you've noticed that like, it might not necessarily be intuitively more important, but part of the argument is explaining why it's more important that, than what happened in top half. And that's a really, really crucial part of an extension because realistically, like, I think, you know, you should have good arguments. You should have arguments that stand on their own, but like an argument can get a hundred percent better just by you using tactics and explaining why it's more important. Um, or why it, it matter it should matter more to the judges than what happened in top half. That's really really crucial, um, and and like uh, as I said, intuitively, like long term effects can sound more important or can feel more important. But you can do the same thing with short term effect. Um, and if it's a new section of the point, it's new material. Like just because a team said, "Oh, people," you know. Uh, you know, just because a team said um, in the North, in the South Korea debate, oh, like this will damage North and South Korea's relationship. If they didn't talk about the long-term effects, talking about the long-term effects of that is still an extension. So it's still new material. It is important for you to point out that it's new material, but it is new material. And um, so I find that that's extremely useful. And a lot of the time when teams come up to me after debates and ask like, what could we have done an extension to win that debate? What would you have said an extension? Like I find more than half the time, I will tell them one point you could have run is that thing OO said, here's the long-term result of it and here's why it's more important. Or that thing that OG said, here's, the, here's why the short-term shock is more important. And like the, long, the long-term sort of general incremental thing doesn't matter when you look at the short-term, when you look at the kind of short-term damage that it does uh, or the short-term benefit of it. Um, point three is something I think a lot of teams miss because it's interesting and it's really interesting because I think it's actually one of the most uh, obvious things in the sense that um, in the sense that you hear teams often um, talking about how they like went into a room or and like heard um the top half case and then they said to themselves like okay they've taken all our material but let's just beat the other bench and come second right now unfortunately what i think what often happens in these situations is that that team can end up actually coming fourth or third you know because one of the top one of the other bench beats your top half team and you because the unfortunate thing, like if you if you just acknowledge to yourself, oh look, we're not beating our own top half team, right? Let's just try and beat the other two. If one of the other two teams beats your top half team and you haven't even tried to beat your top half team, suddenly you are at most third because two teams have beaten you automatically. 
um, and then you could be fourth if the other branch does its job. So I think part of you like you should always bear in mind that there always is a way to beat your top half team or that there normally is a way to beat your top half team but crucially i think in these situations what teams miss which is point three is if they assume their top half team is better than them on material a lot of the time they don't look at what their top half team has done wrong and a lot of the time what that is is something that the other top half team said that they just didn't respond to so is there something that happened in top half let's say you were cg is there something oo said that og just didn't respond to and what is the response and is that a, and is that response good and can you make it into an argument because like half the time um i don't like it's not necessarily useful to to talk about constructive and rebuttal as different a lot of the time they are the same and um, I think that's why integrating rebuttal is becoming so much more popular as a tactic now, because a lot of the time um, rebuttal is substantive or it can be substantive. Um, and interestingly, I think teams lose out some of the time by calling their speech, by calling five minutes of their speech rebuttal. Whereas if they'd spent two more minutes organizing it, it could have just been a case. So if there's anything in top half that your own top half team hasn't responded to you should respond to it and you should explain look this thing just wasn't cleared up in top half here's why like our own team didn't win it but also OO didn't win it because we're winning it and, and a lot of the time you can find that you end up winning because of that so I think it's hard to think of an example for this one um, but I might just invent one um, and pretend it happened because I can't remember any of the world's debates uh, so I don't want to use I can't really use real examples of that happening but um, let's say uh, this house believes that post-genocidal regimes should destroy all places of ex extermination for example death camps so that was round one so let's say you're in a uh, CG and your OG talks exclusively about um I suppose sort of destroying the destroying the sort of memory or the commemoration of the sort of brutalization of people and how what you should do instead is um is like acknowledge that that happened but at the same time uh we should be looking at this community as a whole and we shouldn't be and, th and that sometimes these death camps can kind of serve more as a memory of let's say the nazis than uh, the people they murdered so they they kind of talk about the situations where everyone acknowledges that um that this happened and um, but only ever thinks about it as a negative thing or only ever thinks about that community as as as, as the negative thing that happened to them and um, but then let's say OO responds and says some of the countries that you're talking about have had, you know, difficult relationships with the truth in terms of genocide. So if you're talking about um, getting rid of the, the evidence of the Armenian genocide, that is intensely problematic in that it could fuel um, deni denial of that that had happened. Uh, in that scenario, if your opening government team doesn't respond, you have to um, and you have to come up with a response and that response could be your case so for example uh you could argue that i mean i suppose you you could try and frame it out of the debate um, and you could say you know those countries if if they were like if they if if you're talking about countries where the government is willing to play into denial they might just destroy them anyway for the sake of destroying the evidence or you could make it into more of a case and you could you could uh talk about how what we should do is um is make a huge deal out of the destruction and like if the government should make a massive event of it should should go in with tv cameras and make public the flattening of this place or make public uh, the destruction um, and make a huge statement that we're, we're like moving on from this terrible place in our history and make a big apology out of it um, and so, so sort of make it into an acknowledgement that way 
So you could talk about how just the destruction might actually be more positive for stamping down denial um, than just sort of leaving them there uh, and hoping that people don't uh, sort of think about them. So um, there is a question on differentiating. So um, I'm going to talk about tactics now, uh, which and I'll probably start with the question because I think that's a good place to start. Um, now tactics, what I mean by tactics is basically um, sort of besides coming up with good arguments, what can you do to win from extension? So how should you frame your arguments and what kinds of arguments should you have? Um, and basically kind of how to make your job easier. So the question is, uh, what do you think is the best way of quickly highlighting the difference in your argument to what your opening said, especially when the argument seems uh, intuitively similar? So um, that is a good question. Um, and I think that there are a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, so the, the first one is if, if there is, I suppose, a difference in space or time. I know that sounds bizarre, but I'm going to explain it. If there's a difference spatially or temporally between your arguments, uh, highlight that. So, for, so what I mean by that is if you're talking about different groups, highlight that you are talking about a different group. So yes, we know opening talked about society in general. We are talking about women. Here's why that is more important. And um, that would be, you know, your typical sort of like stereotyped feminist extension, which can actually be really effective if, if I haven't seen one in a while. And I think they're really good a lot of the time. Um, temporally speaking, you would be saying they talked about short term. We are talking about long term. That is why it's different. Now, if your arguments are, I guess, more similar than that, or they seem more similar than that, or there isn't a kind of easy key difference, I think it is worth taking the time and try to be efficient about it, but I do think it is worth taking the time in both extension and sum to like to, to, to explain that. Like I, I know it would be great if ideally there was there were a way to just say, oh, you know, top has said this and we said this and that's why it's different by. Uh, but a lot of the time there just isn't. And it's so worth taking the time to explain. Um, I actually I actually tend to spend a lot of time framing in my extensions and um, possibly too much time, but it works. So I think um, I think it's definitely worth taking the time to explain that. Um, but ways that you can do it more efficiently, I would say, um, and judges love this because it makes the debate clearer for them. I think you should do this in some, but I also do think it's worth doing an extension if you can find the time to do it, um, is to explain the top half clash that you are that you are talking about so like for example if you're uh if you're talking about um the the debate on uh women not taking privileged women not taking affirmative action things and you say look top half clash was about first prop talked about how um this will get more women into feminism because more women will be benefiting from feminism or more diverse groups of women will be benefiting from feminism. And first off said, um, it won't because it'll make affirmative action less legitimate. And then other women won't actually benefit from it because when white women do the thing, other women will feel like, oh, but like if they don't need affirmative action, like I shouldn't need affirmative action. I want to be empowered as well. So like I'm not taking the position either. So no one will actually benefit. Um, and that clash isn't really, really resolved. Point out to the judges that that clash isn't resolved and why it isn't resolved. And then say our extension material uniquely will resolve this clash. And if you then do that successfully, it must be new because if that question was still in the judge's mind at the end of the top half, you have definitely added something to resolve that clash. Um, so I think idea, So I think sometimes it is really ideal to, like not, you should never directly undermine your opening half team, but to kind of like make, make it look as if the teams in the top half are struggling to win over each other. 
but you know which side is right and that's because of your extension so I actually and this is the next thing I want to talk about I actually don't think extensions and summations are as different as people think I think a lot of the time a lot of the tactics that you use in summation you should be using an extension as well so talking about like this is what happened in the top half and like as in this is why our extension was the most important or constantly saying the word extension so that the judges realize you have an extension that's all stuff that if you do in some you should do an extension as well um, and that's one of the reasons I think if you like to speak extension or you like to speak some, I think you should try the other one um, and just use the same tactics that you use. Just don't use new material in, in, in some and use new material in extension. And um, realistically, if you're working as a team, you should be prepping the same material anyway. So I can never understand, like I love speaking in extension, um, but I was a sum speaker for, I think, a year, like a full year, probably a year and a half before I started speaking extension. The only reason I switched was because my partner wanted to. Um, and I think a lot of the time people get stuck in a mindset that they can't sum um, or that they really, really like summing and that they don't like doing extension. Um, and the problem with that is that it's good to be versatile, but it also, I just think, boxes you into this mindset of what an extension is supposed to look like and what a sum is supposed to look like. And realistically, they should both be doing the same thing. Um, so I think those tactics should all be used in extension. Um, so that the sum speaker has less work to do then of trying to prove that your material is new. At that point, they can just be like, here's why it's so much more important. And um, so I'm just going to turn on notifications for the post uh, so that I can see if there are any more questions. So um, I've already talked about prep. And um, I think the next thing is uh, why I love extensions. Um, which is, I think extension is a brilliant position uh, if you are kind of like a little bit conceited and a little bit, you like to get a little bit arrogant and sassy and stuff like that and pretend you're super cool and important because I love doing that in debating, um, you know, like just kind of getting the chance to like finally be uh, a bit big headed and have an excuse to be because you love your material and you want to win the debate. And um, what I mean by that is, uh, I think an extension is a unique opportunity to stand up and just be like, everything that's happened so far is irrelevant and I'm amazing and everything I'm about to say is so important. You should be on the edge of your seats. This is going to be good. So if you, if you are in that mindset or if you have that kind of language in your speech, well, like not, I mean, you, and you obviously shouldn't be rude to people, but if you have that kind of sense around your speech that this is the most important thing the judges will hear, um, that can kind of help you be more confident, but it can also kind of help move the judges into the mindset that you might be winning the debate. Um, and the next tactic thing that I want to talk about is really, really linked to that, um, which is that you should not have a bottle that is longer than a minute or two, especially in CG. Uh, but yeah, basically. So the, the, the way that you should do rebuttal in an extension, I think is quite specific. And again, I think this is similar for some because you don't want your summation speech to be like four minutes of extraneous rebuttal. Oh, and now I'm gonna summarize the debate. It's like, what were you doing for the first four minutes? You were just, I mean, a sum is just a, you attacking everybody. So you might as well just spend the whole time doing that if you're going to spend four minutes and then pretend you're summing the debate. So the way you should do rebuttal in extensions is like, you shouldn't, there is no reason for you as, as the prop extension speaker to have three minutes of rebuttal responding to OO. Like that is a waste of time uh, because you now only have four minutes to do your new material. And also psychologically, it just makes the judges think that your material is less important to you than responding to OO, which makes their material seem more important. Um, and it also just seems like the only team you're interested in beating is OO, uh, which it isn't. So the kinds of new, the kinds of rebuttal that you should have in a prop extension are um, framing, and ideally, it should be efficient, um, and it should do as much damage as possible in as little time as possible. So for example, if you can have two minutes of framing at the start of your speech, 
to explain why both half teams, both top half teams, sorry, are irrelevant to the debate and why your material and possibly CO is the only thing that's actually relevant in the debate and your partner will deal with CO, so that's fine. Um, and you, if you do that so successfully, you are now second. So like, <laughs> that's brilliant. You know, like you have just come second and you're, you are two minutes into your speech, uh, which I think is, is incredibly beneficial um, to, to you as a team. Because uh, all your partner then has to do is beat CO. And like that's one team in seven minutes. That, that should be very, very doable for a competent, for a competent speaker. Um, so for example, uh, in the South Korea debate at Worlds, i um, just going to say the motion again in case anyone's tuned in. Uh, this house believes that South Korea should produce nuclear weapons. Um, if, if you find that the top, like as in, and I do think that you should keep this accurate because you never know kind of what's going to happen in POIs or in rebuttal or whatever. But if you think there is something that has made the top half teams misread geopolitics, so for example, they don't understand the relationship between China and North Korea, or they don't understand how Donald Trump's presidency has affected the relationship between America and South Korea and all their arguments are based on a misread understanding. Two minutes of framing to explain that situation. So like when Donald Trump got elected, this thing happened, blah, blah, blah. Now South Korea plus US equals. And go, and that's why top half doesn't matter. If you have done that successfully and you have any kind of positive extension that plays into that definition, and obviously that is key, like you also need to have an extension. Framing's not enough on its own. But if you do that successfully and your extension is relevant to your metric, you have now come second. So brilliant. Uh, good job. Make sure you beat CO. In CO, I think um, some people have different views on this. Uh, I personally think that you still shouldn't have a lot of extraneous rebuttal in CO. And um, because again, that's kind of just like, because it, what I just said, uh, about about CG is I think one of the reasons one of the one of the things about CG that's really great it's like you're the first speech in the top half so you can kind of pretend to be like a PN claim the top half was irrelevant and then just start start a whole new debate on your own and um, and then you own that debate so in CO if you spend too much time responding to CG extension you're just playing into that narrative and just having their debate and not focusing on your own thing however depending on what the extension was, it still can be useful to have extraneous rebuttal to try and make it irrelevant um, or to try and point out the inconsistencies, obviously. Um, and I think that is the same for CG extension. Like if there's just if there's just a massive hole in OO's case, obviously poke it and then, you know, just move on. Um, and I think it's the same for CO versus CG. But I do think ideally um, what you should be doing with, it, with rebuttal in CO is make sure... Um, you during CG's you, you should you should have written your extension already because after OO speak you know you should be writing your extension so during CG you know you should be kind of still writing your speech but you should be especially concentrating on how does my material clash CG's material and then you basically stand up with this mindset of like oh well it's you know good job on CG running this thing that like my speech totally beats without with me barely having to do any work saws guys but like, you know, that's that my case wins and that's it. And I'm not even going to respond. I'm gonna, not even going to bother responding uh, too extraneously to you guys because my speech will just crush it and that's fine. Uh, so I think that is ideal. And if you have to do a rebuttal, do try and keep it short because remember again, crucially, um, your summation speaker will have seven minutes to respond to the three teams, but you only have seven minutes to do any responses, any framing, any characterization, um, and your entire extension, because otherwise it's not gonna be new in the sum, so there's no point. Um, so, la la la. Um, okay, so the next thing is communication. You need to be able to communicate with your partner in back half. I find that a lot of teams who are good at top half and bad at back half, it's because they can't communicate. Um, the, <laughs> and there are lots of facets to this. Number one, learning to whisper quietly, such an advantage in debating, seriously. Like, 
um, I, I think I can whisper quite quietly. And I think that has been a massive advantage to me in debating because it means that I can essentially explain an entirely new case while the debate is going on. People who can't whisper quietly cannot do that because judges will shush you. If I'm ever judging you in a debate and you whisper too loudly, I'll just shush you until you stop. So learning to whisper quietly, I know it sounds bizarre, is an advantage and you should do it. But you also need to be able to communicate efficiently. Um, so if you can't whisper quietly or you find whispering distracting, um, learn to write in such a way that your partner can understand you but learn to write the shortest sentence po sentences possible that still explain what you're trying to say so during a debate like if you're whether you're whispering or writing to your partner you need to be efficient with the explanation because as long as your partner is listening to you or reading what you've written down they're not listening to the debate so that means if you as a summation speaker have an argument that you think your extension speaker could use any any time that they spend telling you that argument, you are not listening to the speaker that is speaking, which means you might be missing stuff on the extension checklist that I talked about earlier, or you might be missing stuff that is going to be crucial to, for you to respond to. And the summation speaker who's telling you the argument is also missing that stuff because they're concentrating on telling you a thing. So you need to explain it as quickly as possible. Ideally, as if you're a summation speaker or if your partner is a summation speaker, they just need to be able to think on their feet. Because like there have been times, I, there was one debate in particular I remember um, in UCD a couple of years ago when um, the nice boys from Durham had stolen every single thing we wanted to run. And in first prop and we were in closing prop and they had stolen all of our material and i was freaking out and the dlo was like about to sit down i think it was like six and a half minutes into the dlo speech and i was racking my brains trying trying to think of an argument and um, and it was that motion um uh the one about oh yeah uh, this house would teach techniques for sexual gratification in school so they had stolen all of our material about better sex and kind of better sexual education and queer stuff and all that kind of thing. Um, and then six and a half minutes into the DLO speech, I suddenly thought of an argument about rape culture and consent and how, and how when women are taught at a young age that sex isn't necessarily enjoyable and that sex isn't necessarily for them and it's just kind of something that they have to get through because sexual gratification, when it doesn't happen automatically like it does on TV or in porn, um, and they don't know how to do it, they think this is just something I have to do because it's expected of me. And that's a breach of consent. Like that's, that, that is telling women that, that it doesn't matter whether you enjoy something, you should do it anyway, which means it's not for you, which means you don't want to do it. Um, and that leads women into a mindset where they are more likely to accept more severe breaches of consent um, and, and respect themselves less and um, become more vulnerable to abuse. Um, so I thought of that in the last 30 seconds of the DLO speech, which meant that I didn't have time to tell my partner, wrote the word consent down on a page, pointed at it and said, just listen, it'll be fine. <laughs> And then stood up, gave the speech with the one word written down. Um, and she just knew that that sometimes was how I did extensions. And she just had to deal with that and sum my speech um, and respond to the other teams. And it was fine. And we won the debate. Uh, but that was because, I think that was because um, we were both good at thinking on our feet. So you have to be good at thinking on your feet in a, in a summation speech. Like if your partner is an extension and they run something that you weren't expecting, but it's still good. You can't just be like, oh, I'm just going to sum the stuff we discussed in prep. That's just not going to work. There's no point. Um, so do be able to think on your feet, but do be able to communicate. Like, Be efficient and be quiet, um, but try as much as possible to communicate because sometimes um, if a sum speaker has to sum something that they weren't expecting, a lot of the time they might not even necessarily understand it which is going to cause huge problems. I'm just going to open my window. There we go. Um, so that's going to cause huge problems if, uh, if your partner doesn't understand your speech. So try and get good at communicating 
and try and communicate as much as possible during prep um, and during the debate. Uh, but you can't do so in a way that interrupts the debate because that just won't work. So, um, I have a couple more questions. Um, so, I'm going to uh, look at Mila's one first. So, it's when your extension gets stolen in deputy and you need to switch to, to, to a different direction off guard, how do you manage to adapt to complete the new analytical line in the short time you have to write notes for the argument? Okay. So this is a tough one. I think there are a couple of different ways you can do that. And the first one goes back to the thing I said about prep. Ideally, if you prepped properly, even if your material is stolen in deputy, you should still have stuff on your page that you fleshed out a little bit in prep. And um, so doing it in a short time is, is easier than doing a totally new thing that you haven't discussed at all in a short time. Uh, so that's one thing. And um, I think notes are really key to this. I used to write essays before debates. Like, like I had, you know, I would have four A4 sheets and they would all be covered in writing. Um, and I think especially in back half, um, and I, I, I actually speak inside, so I speak deputy in top half and then I speak extension in back half, or at least that's what I did when Michael and I were speaking for Worlds and Euros and he was kind of my... Uh, latest and most long-term partners. That's that's the way I kind of think of myself as a speaker. Um, so I used to go into a debate in top half with nothing written down, because that's the way I think you should do deputy. But in back half, I would go into a debate, just one or two sheets with, you know, the list of ideas that I talked about earlier. But then during the debate, I would, I wouldn't necessarily use everything I wrote down. Like I would write an argument. And then if the team in top half said it, I'd just throw it away. Um, or, but, but I would go up to the table with as little writing as possible. I know that might sound weird if any of you have seen me speak because I usually have like 10 sheets of paper, but the reality is that about six of those only have one sentence on them. And that is because for me, there are certain sentences that I need to have written in big giant letters to remind me to say them word for word, uh, because they're key sentences to my case. So, so. So by and large, I'll have not a lot written down. And the reason for that is because um, the more time you have to, the more time you have to spend writing your case, um, the less able you are to adapt. Because if it's going to take you a full seven minutes to write down what you're trying to say, um, if you are in CO and DLO takes all your material, you now only have seven minutes to write but you also have to do responses to CG and stuff like that so you're kind of screwed so you need to be an efficient writer I think um, and I think ideally um, you should like I think a lot of this is about practice to be honest like I think especially when you're when you're dealing with a case where your case has been stolen in decky or where the, or the earth has been completely scorched um, I think debating with good with good teams and top half in training sessions, like try and get the best speakers in your university to come to training sessions, put them in top half with weaker speakers behind them and get the weaker speakers to practice. Um, or for example, um, I actually think quite a good way to practice is um, in your training sessions or even just with you and your partner, um, you can prep a debate but it's like a world's final um, and then watch the first half of the video and then do, do your extension. So you're extending off some of the best speakers in the world without having to have them in the room with you. Um, and I think that can be a good way to kind of practice it. But to be honest, in terms of how you think on your feet and how you adapt, I think that's a skill and it's, kind, it's, not, a kind, it's not a skill that I can just say um, and then give to you. I think it's I think it's a skill that comes with practice. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about is framing. So framing and characterization, I think, are really really important in extension. Um, and the reason is that I think, as I was kind as I kind of suggested earlier, I think. One of the most important things in extension or one of the easiest ways to win an extension is to um, make the judges feel like the top half didn't matter 
or like the top half um, mattered a lot less than your case. But you can't really do that without talking about like why basically. Um, and you can't really do that without kind of like painting a new picture and being like, look, top half were fine, they said words. Um, but they weren't talking about the real debate. Um, so I think in the time that you might in LO spend on rebuttal to PM, spend that time framing and characterizing. Um, because if you use framing well, um, you can beat one or two teams in, in like very speedily. Uh, so for example, describing in a, in a debate the relationship between uh, different countries if it hasn't been described yet. It can also be really useful because it can make your case seem kind of more clear and more sensible, which can just kind of instinctively make judges want to give you the win. Um, and uh, I think it can be really useful, especially in messy debates, to kind of be like, look, this is what the world actually looks like. Stop being so messy and crazy top half. Um, so I know that there is a really good workshop on framing uh, on YouTube. It's an Adam Hawksby one, I think. So it, like, um, I would suggest watching that. And um, so I don't want to go kind of too far into it because it probably is something that you could do a whole workshop on very easily. Um, but what I will say is that you should, um, I suppose, the, the, what you need from framing um, is to show why you're, either why your material is new or why your new material is more important. So a lot of the time the links can be quite tenuous. So like for example, I've definitely gotten up an extension in debates and just been like, so like, the way in which, you know, Xi Jinping tends to, to behave as president of China and then just kind of rambled about that for like a minute or two and then just gone, you know, and that's why our case, <laughs> which just like is kind of, it, it's, it's like, I think it's framing and characterization are weird in the sense that like, uh, but, but in a very advantageous sense, in the sense that like there are a thousand different things that you can frame on in a debate. Talking about the South Korea debate, you could easily get up in extension and frame on uh, South Korean political climate, North Korean political climate, American political climate, Japanese, Chinese, uh, ASEAN political climate, and um, general sort of Southeast Asia political climate, and um, how nuclear weapons work nuclear disarmament, the Iran deal. Like you could get up and do seven minutes of just information and characterization of what the world looks like. So realistically, what you're, uh, what you're choosing to frame on isn't, ne isn't actually realistically the most important information for the debate. It is the information that makes your case win the debate because like and like maybe that's like lying or i guess not you know it's not always and i think you should use accurate information but it's not always the whole picture but no debate is the whole picture so i think you need to be tactical about what information you choose to give the judges and what you choose to focus on and and never focus on something that makes top half look more important always focus on something that makes them look you know smart but not as smart as you and makes you look like the smartest and um, and focus on material that allows your case to, to kind of seem as if, you know, as if, as if the top half have missed this massive crucial thing, even though you're missing a massive crucial thing, probably, because, you know, we all miss massive crucial things in debates. And the reason that this works, and I probably keep coming back to this, but it is just the brilliant thing about extensions, um, top half don't get to say anything anymore they're done they maybe get a poi or two they probably will only get to poi you once because you probably will take one poi from back half and one poi from top half that's what i think you should do in in back half um so they're done and they can't they cannot now get up and respond and talk about why their case is actually more important or talk about why your information doesn't matter which means you have this unique power of characterization by being like 
I'm going to frame on, you know, the relationship between China and North Korea. And I don't give a shit about the US and North Korea because that's not relevant to my case, but it's not like top half are going to challenge me on it. I mean, they can in a single POI, which I can probably laugh off and respond to quickly and then move on. Um, but they can't, they do not have the control anymore that you have now uh, in framing. So I think framing is really, really useful um, as, a, as, a, as a kind of skill to develop and as a tactic to use. Um, and within that, uh, I think that ideally, in order to get better at extensions, you should have as much um you should learn as much as you possibly can and you should have as much information as you possibly can and um, i think case filing is really important i actually don't think it's important to have a physical case file that you bring to an international competition making a case file is the important bit having it isn't super important but making it is so reading the articles reading the country files and um, reading about different world leaders and they, the way they tend to act on different things and um, and reading about you know reading about subjects that you know nothing about so, so so for me it was always economics so case filing on economics was super useful to me i didn't print out a bunch of economic material and bring it to um and bring it to um worlds or euros uh, i think the stuff that michael and i brought to <laughs> brought to worse on euros was um a list of every world leader's name to make us sound like we knew things <laughs> um, and a list of the names of like the chief economists of the IMF and World Bank and stuff like that uh, and like some I think the country file on Poland because we were debating in Poland and like that was all we brought there but we had been reading articles and 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 consuming information the entire time during the summer so we were prepping a lot we just didn't see the sense in bringing this massive folder to worlds or to euros because um we knew we weren't going to read it like in prep you don't have time but the reason that this is important for extensions is that i think a lot of the time if you have information and um, it's a lot easier to get up an extension and be like look guys i'm super sorry but like you just don't know anything about the philippines which is why all 28 minutes of that top half was irrelevant and like you might be wrong like you might kind of be using the information that you have in order to lie about top half uh, but that will help you and you also might be right so having information is super super useful in crafting an extension and um, especially in crafting an extension that's going to win the debate and um, and i know that like you know some people are kind of uh you know, I know the opinions differ on this topic a lot. I know some people kind of have been saying a lot lately that it's, that, you know, like it's not okay for CA teams to have motions about info slides and like you should give people more information and stuff like that. But realistically, if you want to get good at back half, anything that's on an info slide, top half will have absolutely run through already. Because like, well, if they're competent and if they're not competent, then you don't need to worry. If they're competent, they will have used the information on the info slide to their advantage anyway, which means you need more information than that. It's, especially if it's an info heavy debate, but even if it's not, like even if it's a debate that, you know, any debater could, could do quite intuitively, you know, even if it's one, um, even if it's just a social policy debate about prisons or welfare or something, if you know how that kind of thing works, you can be like, look, that's just, I mean, like, like yeah, like a welfare debate is a really good example. So like if, if you talk about um, welfare and one team talks about, you know, benefit scroungers and people defrauding the welfare system, you can get up and back half and be like fraud accounts for like, you know, less than a percent of welfare claimants. I don't actually know. I, I, I know the number is really small. I don't know that it's less than a percent. I think it is. It might be. But if you can get up and say the accurate number and say like this percent of welfare claimants are fraudsters, so I don't care about your case. It's like suddenly their case, their case isn't important or it doesn't like it doesn't matter. It certainly doesn't matter as much as your case. Hopefully, if you have a if you have a decent case at that stage, so having information I think can be really really important in back half, and um, and I think that you should use it in framing and I think that you should use it in characterization. And the last thing in tactics um, is that you should talk about where your extension is and why it's an extension in both speeches. Don't leave it up to the summary speaker. Um, 
And I genuinely just think that is a psychological thing because when judges hear similar arguments, some of them just stop writing. And I know they shouldn't, but some of them do. And even when they don't, they kind of pay slightly less attention because they're just kind of thinking to themselves, I've, like I've heard this before, this is an extension. So it's not winning. And then when some speaker gets up and says, oh, but it definitely was an extension, suddenly the judge has missed parts of it. So it's important for you to be pointing that out in extension as well. Um, so I'm going to move on to the uh, other, the last the two questions um, that have been asked. Um, I'm kind of done with the, with the core stuff that I wanted to get through here. Um, so if anyone does have any questions at this point, um, I would encourage you to post them now uh, because uh, otherwise I'll just kind of be waiting silently <laughs> and I think that would be awkward for me anyway probably not for you guys because I can't see or hear you but anyway it's fine so the first question was is there a good way to differentiate or compare principled arguments in extension so this is interesting and I, there's been a lot of discussion lately like maybe it's just on debating shit posting I don't know there seems to have been a lot of debate discussion lately about principled arguments in debating and whether they work and whether you should use them. Um, I think principled arguments always have a practical element and I think practical ar arguments always have a principled element. I actually think nine arguments out of 10 in debating are both, but it's just that it's, it's about the language we use to talk about them rather than the argument themselves. So for example, um, in the debate, uh, this I think this the women debate from Worlds will, will be a good one to talk about here. This house believes that the world would be a better place if women from privileged backgrounds turned down any benefits arising from affirmative action programs. Now, I think you could make a pretty solid principled prop case that privileged women have a principled duty to give up these positions or that it is principally wrong for them to take those positions when other women need them more. Now that argument has a really clear practical element because like clearly the, the duty that they have is to help materially improve the lives of other women, which is a practical benefit of, of them doing that. So like if you do an extra minute of analytical work, you now have a principled case and a practical case. So like, why wouldn't you? And then on the other side of it, if you say um, on, uh, on proposition, um, practically the most important thing in this debate is helping the most vulnerable women. And when white middle class women give up these positions, um, other women will get to take them. Uh, that is a practical argument but it does have a principled element which is that principally the most vulnerable people are the most important in the debate and like that's something that a lot of speakers including me frequently uh will i think there was even a meme about this and um, will frequently just say the vulnerable the most important people in this debate and not justify that and i think that's the problem with principled arguments that a lot of the time people just say them like they just say like this is just wrong or this is just correct because I know it is in like my bones or whatever, um, which is like not good, but it's kind of hard. I think it's kind of hard to justify a principled argument, but the reality is that most of the practical arguments you run have principled elements, and most of the principled arguments you run have practical elements. So to answer the question, I would say two things. The first thing is, interestingly, I think I am now going to add another point to my extension checklist, which is to say, um, if top half have talked exclusively in language about practicalities, you can frame the principle as the most important in the debate. Or if, or if top half have talked exclusively about principles, you can frame your case as, um, the only reason principles exist is to get things for people. Duty is about giving people stuff. And morality is about you know, protecting people and, and sort of defending people's rights. So practically, so if we have a good practical case, then we win. Um, so that is another thing that you can add to your extension checklist. Um, the other thing is that I, um, in terms of a way to differentiate principled arguments in extension, 
Um, I think it's, I mean, and, and you can feel free to, to like write a reply to your comment um, if I'm not answering this properly or if your question means something else. I think it's pretty much the same as the same way as you would differentiate any argument um, in the sense that what you need to do is explain hopefully why your principled case is the is the most valid principle or for example if as i was saying before if top half have only talked about practical arguments and um, if you can attach your principled case to some kind of inalienable right or like inalienable sense of justice that it's easy to convince the judges is inalienable and um, then you can sort of compare that principled argument so so a good example of this this wasn't actually in an um, extension, but I remember there was a debate at Vienna um, where, what was the motion? Oh yeah, the motion was about um, reporting on something, something, mental illness in the media, something. I don't remember what it was, but a team on prop in DPM were like, nothing that ops say matters because uh doing this in the media to people's families is psychological torture and you cannot torture people under any circumstances so i don't care what ops say principally it doesn't matter it's torture and that was really hard to respond to and that team ended up winning that debate i think because um it's really if, if you and it is hard to explain a principle in this way. It is really, really difficult to explain why a principle matters. And a lot of the time when you ask people to explain why a principle matters, they say, oh, because practically, and then, you know, they're doing a practical thing now uh, instead of a principle thing. Um, but if you can explain it by tying it to something intuitive or something that we all think is right, so like the fairness in the justice system or... Um, you know not wanting to support torture or not wanting to support sexual assault or something like that and um, it can be really really useful uh, i hope i've answered that but if i haven't um feel free to, to add another comment um, and i'll see if i can uh, respond so the next thing is speaking of pois when uh argument slash timing wise and from who do you take pois from when extending aha tactics my favorite thing right so i think you should take a POI, you shouldn't do the thing in extension of taking a POI at one minute because you probably haven't, it's not clear yet what your extension is, so you're not letting the team actually respond to your extension. But you also should not do the thing of waiting until minute six because, and, and I think the assumption that we should always make because occasion, sometimes this is true, so you should always assume it's true because this is the worst case scenario, the time that you should leave yourself to get the POI and respond to the POI is a full minute. So if you take a POI at six minutes, your speech is over. Because if you think about the really, really good POIs that you've heard, the ones that can't just be answered with, no, that's bullshit uh, because X reason moving on in six seconds. Um, or I already answered that C.2 when I said X moving on. The good POIs, I would say a lot of them will take 45 seconds to respond to or potentially even longer. So I think you need to not wait until minute six, uh, but I also think it's ideal to get it done before minute five. Because you know the way like judges have this weird thing about saying like, oh, that argument didn't come in until the last minute of your speech. Like it doesn't matter really, like, does it? I mean, just because, so, like if the most important point in your speech comes in the last minute of your speech, and then a judge is like, oh, but it came in the last minute of your speech. Well, like, if I'm not supposed to make arguments in the last minute of my speech, why does it exist? So I don't really buy into that framework or in that mindset. But I do think that judges can be annoyed by important stuff coming in the last minute of your speech or important stuff starting in the last minute of your speech. But I also think especially, let's say you're op extension. If you say something really important in the last minute of your speech, um, gov whip will get more leeway for not responding to it because in in fairness it is kind of hard to respond to something when you're about to stand up and it just happened so i think the ideal time to take a poi in um in back half is no later than the beginning of the fourth minute so the problem is if you've done a lot of framing sometimes that's impossible 
but I think ideally you will have finished your first point or you'll be into your first point enough that everybody understands what it's trying to say. And then you take a POI, answer it, move on, do your second point if you have one or flesh out your first point to the end. And then you still have enough time to properly prioritize and to properly do the rest of your speech um, without having that sort of rush. Um, in terms of from whom you should take a POI, I am of the opinion that every team in the debate should take a POI from top half and back half. I think it depends on which side you're on in terms of when you take them. So if you are in CG extension, you should always, no matter what, take a POI from CO because that is your best chance to hear what that, their extension is before they stand up. Because at that stage, if they, like C CO are never or should, are never going to or should never give away their extension in a POI to top half. Because when DPM is speaking, if I as op extension give a POI to DPM explaining what my extension is, DLO is going to steal it. So the only time CO are going to reveal their extension is in a POI to CG. So if you are CG extension, take a POI from CO. If you are CO extension, um, it doesn't really matter, I guess, but I think ideally, tactically, it might be a good idea to take one from opening. And the reason for this is that CG are about to get a chance to respond to you, whereas opening haven't had, like, like, are only going to get one when they get a POI. So you're about to hear all of CG's responses, and then you can respond to them. But so, like, let's say you take a POI from OG. Um, in CO extension, good, you know, you answer it, that's fine. When Gov with then gives all of their responses to, see, to, to your, to, in their sum, your sum speaker can then stand up and say, here is why their responses were um, non-existent or inadequate or just shit basically. Um, and they can take a challenge from CG and say, fine, like if you think I'm not responding to your responses properly, um, or if you would like to actually give me a response for the first time in the debate, give me a POI. And then, ta so tactically, I think in CG extension, take CO, and in CO extension, take OG, and then have your partner take CG. Just tactically in terms of making your speech seem like you're being really fair to everyone and giving them all the chances to respond to you, and they're still losing because they suck and you're great. That's the narrative that you should always be perpetuating. And really don't do the thing of trying to base it on um, your prediction of how good the teams are. Because especially especially at a competition like Euros and Worlds, sometimes a team will be like, oh, you know, Oxford are in this position, so we should take two POIs from them because they're better. Um, and they'll be better, they'll be a better team and they'll have better POIs and we'll have a chance of beating them. The reality is that you just don't know if the other team are good. And even if you, even if Oxford are better than them, or even if whoever it is is better than better than them. By not taking a POI from the other team, you run the risk of being beaten by two teams. Uh, you know, the first one because you think they're better or they, and they might, you might be right. And the second one because you didn't engage. So always do take both teams and uh, no matter your tactics within that. So, and the last uh, question on the post is, could you describe how you think about the prioritization of which, of which other teams to rebut slash prove you beat slash frame out. In other words, how you see strategy and CG and CO. Um, so my partner, Michael, had a really cool strategy for summation, which I think is quite a useful way of thinking about this. Um, which is, and I don't think that you prioritize any part of this over any other part because outside of a debate you can't see how to do that um, and i'll explain more about that in a minute but basically his strategy was this um in summation he would go okay so the top half clash was this here's why my partner actually won that in her extension uh the other back half team said this here's where she beat them and here's where in a vacuum forgetting about all the other teams my partner's substantive material was also the most important thing in the debate, the most impactful thing in the debate, and the thing that would have won any debate on this subject. So three prongs, um, one of them deals with two teams, another one deals with 
the other team and the la- the final one just deals with my partner is fucking class. Uh, probably shouldn't swear, but whatever. Um, so I, f- I always found that, that framework quite useful. Um, and I think that it is good tr- to try to beat the top half teams at the same time by talking about how they weren't debating the real debate. Or for example, um, it can be useful, like basically what I'm saying is it, it's useful to box teams into categories and beat them at the same time because then you have to spend less time on it. So you can box in top half and say they weren't doing the real debate, so it doesn't matter. Uh, you can box in your other bench uh, by saying something like, and I don't think you should ever actually say your opposite team didn't have an extension because I just think that kind of comes across as a bit petty. And um, to be like, oh, you didn't have an extension. Like, it's a bit weird. Like, it's the judge's job to decide that, not yours. But if their material was similar, you can say, well, we, we obviously beat both op teams because they both talked about this and we talked about why that is um, nonsense. So ideally, efficiently, you should be trying to work. I, I, don't think, I don't think it's super easy to defeat a diagonal at the same time because diagonals tend to be a bit like it's not going to work really nor- normally anyway. Um, if you can beat all three teams at the same time by, talking, by saying none of them talked about anything important, fair enough. Um, but I think boxing teams in like that can help. Prioritization of those things doesn't work Gen- it, it won't won't work if you try and do it generally for every debate. So what I mean by that is you you there there is no way you can go into it you can go into all your future debates thinking, well we're CG, so the most important thing to talk about is why we beat OG. And um, because your OO team might be amazing, and then the most important thing is probably thinking about how to beat them. But actually, that's not even really true. The most important thing is beating everybody. Um, you can't realistically prioritize one team over another team too much. You should prioritize the amount of time you spend based on the teams that you think you are most at risk of losing to. But you should still take POIs from both teams and you should still have lines in your speech, in both speeches, about why you beat each team. Um, and the way that I do this efficiently is basically when my extension is written down, I will pick a different color pen and write the names of the teams I am beating beside arguments. So like if I have an argument in the women debate about trans women, and like I think that that quite handily defeats OG, I'll just write OG next to it to remind myself to say, oh, and by the way, that beats OG's material on this because of all all this stuff. Um, But you should be focused on beating all teams because in reality, it's very, very hard to see what's happening in debate from inside of it. So you shouldn't be prioritizing to the extent that you've neglected to rebut a team um, or to frame out a team because you just might be wrong. They might be winning and you won't know. So you should sort of target all of them. Um, and I do think, you know, like it's important to, to understand which one you tend to be less good at and then maybe focus there. So for example, some teams are really, really good at rebuttal, um, but they don't know how to frame out their opening teams. Uh, Or some teams frame out their own opening teams too obviously and kind of don't, it doesn't work. Um, And then they forget to respond to the other side. So sometimes it's about what what you need to work on and then sometimes it's about predict, like seeing what's happening in the debate. Um, But it is really, really important to try and frame out all the teams and try and rebut all the teams because you just don't know what's happening inside the debate. Um, and I think all, you should always be preparing for a good room where everyone is good and everyone has a chance to win. Uh, because otherwise, once you get to those rooms, you won't know what to do. So that is what I would say to that. Um, I'm just going to wait a minute or so uh, to see if anyone has any more final questions um, because I think I've answered them all now. Um, I'm going to post my extension checklist on the thread with questions if anyone would like to see it um, and uh, and oh, and also if anybody has any questions in terms of resources so like how to case file what to case file you can post them on the thread too and I'm happy to reply to them um, but oh there's another one yep um, and so if anyone has 
and and you know, obviously, if anyone has any follow up questions or anything like that, and um, I'm to, I'm I'm just I've kept notifications on for that thread, um, and I'm totally happy to keep responding to it based on material that I have or um, you know, sort of resources that I have saved. I uh, extension checklist because. Uh, I think that is a really, really useful resource. It's something that I've given to people a lot after debates. Uh, and a lot of people have told me that they've never kind of been coached on that or never um, thought about it. So I, I do think that's that can be helpful. Oh, and obviously if anybody has things that they would add to it or other resources that they'd like to share, um, I definitely welcome um, you posting them on the thread as well because I think uh, they can be really useful for other people. And um, a lot of the time, um, everybody kind of learning from each other is the most useful way to go about improving. So I think, um, okay, so someone's just posted uh, case filing recommendations for euros would be massively useful. And then someone else, oh, that's just, thank you, cool. Um, so I'm just going to quickly pull out my thingy. Ooh. I'm just going to go into my Google Drive and um look at my case filing stuff i'm coaching some teams uh, at the moment and i have decided to be totally mean to them about how much they have to case file so i have uh, a, a case filing template that i will uh go into and see, oh no hang on that's the wrong drive but I'm going to go into and see um, what recommendations I've written down for them and then I'll share them on the thing. Um, so, doo -doo. okay. Yeah, so um, in terms of what you should bring to Euros, uh, I think. I would strongly endorse the approach that Michael took, that Michael and I took. I'm not saying that you should only bring these things. If you want to bring more, that's fine. But a list of all the world leaders and their names, super useful. Because in a debate about international relations, for example, which I know a lot of people struggle with their international economics, being able to say Xi Jinping acts in this way is so much more you know, it's, it seems so much more like you know what you're talking about than saying China acts this way. Because you like, you, it seems like you know the political situation. And um, I also think just like a list of international organizations and like what they do and what they just briefly what their purpose is can be really useful. Because sometimes when somebody says IMF and then somebody else says World Bank and you're like, I literally do not know the difference. And um, which I still don't really. Uh, Michael used to have to explain it to me every time we were prepping a case. Uh, on, on that subject, obviously. Um, so I think that can be really useful as well. Um, and then I think that um, ideally you should have a relationship chart between, uh, between important countries that tend to come up in debates. So countries like the USA, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Japan, countries like that have a chart my mum's coming in, I'm just saying hello. Um, and having, having a chart that describes the relationships between those countries. So like, just make one yourself even, put the countries all on a circle-y thing and then draw arrows between them that are like green for friendship, um, you know, red for unfriendly, black for very unfriendly, uh, something yellow for neutral. Because um, I think it can be really, really useful for just reminding yourself, like if you're in a debate about the Philippines and you're kind of going, I actually can't, remember if they're mates with China or the US or both and that probably is going to be important and um, so that can be really useful uh, you should have a prep checklist I think I think that can be really useful um, and I think you should also uh, have so I think you should case file on information on international relations and economics um, and probably science as well and um, although I don't think you need to bring all of that information with you so that stuff is like uh, information on international organizations. So organizations like the UN, ASEAN, uh, the Arab League, the IMF. Uh, the things that you should know are its purpose, its rules, uh, particularly its voting rights and rules. So for example, um, super useful fact 
that we had just Googled before um, Warsaw Euros is that Michael and I realized that within the IMF, because uh, voting rights are based on the amount of cash you give the organization, well, I think it's the IMF, it's either the IMF or the World Bank, which doesn't really matter, and um, the money that you give the organization transfers directly into votes, which means that I'm pretty sure the US has like 87% of the voting rights, which obviously is, you know, probably bad or something. Uh, that kind of stuff can be really useful. Then you should know their uh, member states and like who, do, who their leaders are. So like, where are they from? What do they, what do, they do? What are their kind of reputations is about that? Um, and then certain countries, so like big important countries like that we debate about a lot, like the US and Syria and um, stuff like that, places like that. But also um, you should know this stuff about Estonia and local countries, so like Eastern European countries, because um, that is where we are going to Euros, and it means that there might be a local motion, there often is. Um, and even if there isn't, it's kind of useful to kind of know where you are um, and, and, and know how to debate about the, the things that local judges will understand um, and, and will kind of tap into and stuff like that. You should know the country's age, its colonial status, uh, stuff about the economy, so like the main industry sectors, its natural resources, average income, um, GDP and wealth inequality can be really important. Uh, it's a head of government, some information about them, relationships with other states, its social makeup, so ethnicity, religion, um, stuff like that, and its system of government. Um, and I have lists I have a list I think of institutions that I think are useful to know about but actually I I, I won't I don't need to go through it now because I think basically any big regional or international institution that has political power you you should probably have some kind of fact file on even something like that you never hear about in debating. So like, I haven't heard anything about the Arab League like ever in debating, but I do think it's a useful one to know about. Um, and, uh, you know, and the African Union and stuff is coming up a lot more often now. So I think just look up like international intergovernmental organizations, give, do a fact file on each one, it's gonna be super useful. Um, and then in terms of countries you should know about, I think um, I'm just gonna post, uh, no, I'm actually not going to post the full list because it's really long. Um, but I think you should, I'm, I'm ba I'll basically, because like I, I, I'm coaching, so I'm, I'm trying to make the people that I'm coaching do loads and loads of work. Um, but I think basically what you should do is you should know about, you should know quite a few things about at least two countries from each region. So like Africa, um, North America, Central and South America, uh, East Asia, Central Asia, ideally, if you can make them do You can do both, but they're quite different. Um, and Europe, and then like kind of Oceania, Australia stuff, place. Um, so you should know probably about two countries from each place to avoid that situation where you're in a debate about Africa and all you talk about is the DRC. Because like you don't, that just makes you look like you don't know anything else. So I think two countries is ideal. Um, I've just had a question from Helsinki, which is, could you, um, what is your prep checklist like and could you post it? Um, yeah, I'll post my, I will post my prep checklist on, um, on the thread because I think it can be really useful. Now, the important thing is to know about a prep checklist is, um, what was I going to say? The important thing to know about a prep checklist is that someone's prep checklist won't necessarily work for someone else. So I think you should take this prep checklist, try using it, but then add to it and take stuff out that you didn't find useful. So ideally, like you can start with mine if you want, but I built my prep checklist from scratch with my partner over like nearly an entire semester of debating because we, we were kind of building it based on what was working and what wasn't working. And um, we didn't really use it for Euros because we kind of got lazy, but it was really useful and um, coming up to Worlds. So I'm gonna post that. Um, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, I think this is gonna be recorded uh, I don't, I don't, I assume so, uh, um, but thanks for coming.
Um, and obviously, if you want, if you have any follow-up questions or anything like that, you can post them on the thread, um, and I'll uh, totally answer. Uh, so thanks again, and ooh, someone else just right before. Yeah, no, that was fine. It's not a question. Okay, so thanks, everybody. Bye. Happy extensioning.